Taylor Zarzer, Sirius XM. Coach, how has your relationship with Quinn evolved, especially in the last year? I know your connection, especially with point guards who have to be leaders, has always been so special. But did something happen before last season with the two of you or with the staff, et cetera, when it comes to Quinn? Yeah, well, we've always had a good relationship. You know, uh, I think when it's not just a certain player, but any leader of our past teams, you know, when you have leaders, you get to be a little bit closer to them because they, it's not just about X's and O's, it's about what you're, just how you're living as a group. And uh, right at the end of last season, after the season, uh, we sat down with all of our players and with Quinn, we talked about the fact that here's this class that's coming in. Uh, Tyus is one of the really good point guards People think of you as a point guard. They just put you in there. But you, you have been a guard for us. And you're, you're our best shooter. You're going to be our oldest player. You know, where does that fit? How does that fit? And, and I tried to explain how I thought it was. And, uh, and he said, yeah, that's how I would fit. And I said, so here, I would, I'm going to depend on you. And he's taken that to the highest level. And so along through the season, yeah, you just become really close to somebody. Yeah, you know, it's like the frequency of contact and intimacy in, in intimate, you know, situations and in tough situations that a relationship grows. And, you know, I, I, you know we, we have an unbelievable relationship. Right here. Coach Noah Kozlov, Cinesport. Coach Izzo. I asked him about how far back you two go, and he, and he talked about recruiting Chris Weber, and that's when you two first oh. met. What do you remember about those, any about early times with Coach Izzo? Well, we were both unsuccessful. You know, uh, I guess that's the first thing. Now, I, you know, Tom's a guy's guy, and he was on a staff where you know, I respected Judd Heathcote and really loved Judd. And uh, you always respected Michigan State, you know, before when Judd was the coach, and obviously since Tom's been the head coach, and basically that you, there were no errors about him. You know, basically, you know, what, he, what he was, he's genuine. He's a genuine guy. And he wasn't trying to manipulate or anything like that. And, and then he gives back, you know, with the coaches, you know, the coaching fraternity, you know, whether it be on the board of the NABC, and, you know, he's a team player. And you get to know the guys who are team players better, who are in your, uh, in your profession. I mean, I'm sure you do in your own profession. And uh, he's the ultimate guy for that. You know, there, I don't think there's a guy out there who would, who would say something, even the slightest negative about, about Tom. Right over here, Jim. Jim O'Connell, Associated Press. What's your name again? What's <laughs> I'm the new guy here. You, know, you, you the, uh, haven't shown up for a long time. I know. So. I'm sorry. I have a note from the doctor. It's okay. I All right. All right. The, uh, it was just, you've been to so many Final Fours. Is there something that you've done at every Final Four? And, and I don't mean in a superstitious way, but is there something that you found helps your team when you get to a level like this? And then the other thing, how different is the Final Four now from when it was the first time you went to one? Well, I'll take the, the, the second question first. You know, it's changed a lot. It keeps improving. Uh, one, the stature of it keeps growing because our game keeps growing, and that, that's a really good thing. And, uh, and then the organizers of the event, how the NCAA has put it on, it keeps getting better. Uh, I, I think the influence of Dan Gavitt and Joanne Scott uh, on this Final Four has been remarkable. You can see uh, a lot of new things that have been placed, you know, where it's for the players, the locker rooms, the, you just ever, you know, there's a, it, it keeps getting better, how the teams are treated. You know, I just talked about the ability to come into the gym and, you know, really get comfortable with the gym. I think earlier it was more like, being used is, is too harsh, but it wasn't player sensitive. You know, it wasn't team sensitive as much as it is now. I, I think the teams, the players are well, well taken care of. Uh, they have an amazing experience. They're not, ex 
again, again, this is a harsher word, exploit, and I wish I had a better vocab, a, a softer word then. But uh, even like the, last night, you know, we, we went to the, uh, the thing they do for the fans, I don't know what they call that. Fan the fest. Fan fest, a tough word. Uh, and it's beautiful, it's just beautiful, but it was just for all the teams. So they weren't inundated with fans. So they all, those, they all had a good time. And then we went to the salute uh, a presentation and instead of it being long and drawn out, Jim Nance and the NCAA, CBS, Turner, you know, really made all those kids feel, uh, feel good. As far as how we've changed, you know, the first time you go into it, you don't know what the heck you're going into. And uh, so I think the main thing, Ock, that we've done is we've, we, we refer to uh, like what was good for us when we left, how we traveled, when we practiced, you know, that type of thing, what we did, you know, while, you know, while we were in the Final Four. And, uh, and it's a combination of all those things. So it's more of an evolution of what you do. But uh, the main thing is, is how good the NCAA, you know, how good they've been. And again, I want to mention Dan Gabbett and Joanne Scott again. They've been, uh, that, they've been great. Right back here, Nancy. Sam USA Today Sports. Mike, um, John has gotten some criticism for his using one and for the number of one and done players. John Cal Perry? Yes, sorry. Okay. Um, gotten criticism for one and dones, but it's not a phenomenon unique, unique to Kentucky. Do you think it's it's fair the criticism he's gotten, and, and how much of a reality does it have to be for coaches now, you know, knowing that you're going to have some kids who are only there for a year? Well, I think a lot of criticism we get as players and coaches are, it's not right. You know, like, uh, look, it's there. You, you know, what are you going to discriminate against one and done? You know, where, where are these kids going to go and how, how well can they be taken care of? I, you know, we, when we recruit a kid, we don't say you're one and done, but we recognize that he could be. And, and basically you say, look, when you're here at our school, uh, you're going to have to go to class, you're going to have to you know, move forward towards a degree at Duke, you're going to be treated, you know, we don't have athletic dorms, you're going to be, you're going to be a student, and, you know, if they qualify and adhere to all that, then that's good. One thing that's, you, you sh I think if you, in college today, there are many kids who are not graduating from college who find something in a profession before the, the end of four years to do something. The other thing is I think our sport, you know, like I just, I have a Sirius XM show that I've had for 10 years. This, this past week we had Mike Trout on. Okay, he's a great, like at 17 he was playing minor league baseball. He's 23 and he's the best player maybe in the major leagues. You know, they have their thing where you either go out of high school or you come for three years. In other words, you. Yeah, I think, yeah, he shouldn't be criticized for that. Although, I mean, I say that and we shouldn't be either, you know, because uh, our kids are good. I, you know, they become successful and, uh, and then we have no control over that. That'll be uh, the next time there's a collective bargaining agreement between the Players Association and, and the NBA owners, I'm sure that'll come up. But it seems like there are two opposite ends of that, I think Adam and the NBA would like to. And from what initially has come out from uh, counsel from the players' union is that they would like uh, kids to be able to come right out of high school. So it, to me, that's a pretty big variance. Over here, Matt Norlander, CBSSports.com. Mike, uh, when you look at Jaleel, Willie Cauley Stein, Carl Anthony Towns. And Frank, um, is this the best collection of big men you can remember in a Final Four? If not, what would you say rivals it? And is there a correlation with the fact that arguably the best four big men in the game are playing here in Indianapolis? Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not as good a basketball historian to really, I'm, to remember who is in all these Final Fours. Uh, I, I will speak to this Final Four. You, you, you have a great collection of big men. 
you know, I mean, uh, Ja, you know, is, is just a, an, ex, an amazing talent who's only going to get better. And Frank, you have somebody who, you know, I, I think it, it's one of those uh, great collegiate stories where you come in and, like, that kid's not going to be that good, and, oh, he's pretty good, and he's great. You know, that, what, a, what a neat story with that. And uh, Towns is a little bit more like Ja. You know, he's an amazing talent, great kid. And Willie Cauley-Stein is uh, the gifted athlete at seven feet that was playing a different sport. And, and John was able to, uh, John Calperi was able to, to see that. So uh, th that's a lot, of t a lot of talent here. You know, big time talent. I'm sure all four of those guys are looked upon very highly by the uh, by the NBA. Right over here, uh, Stuart Mandel from FoxSports.com. Mike, on the subject you were just talking about, how you identify guys who could become one and dones with this particular year, this particular class, was there any <coughs> reservation at all on your part that? These are great players, but we may have to replace as many as three of them after one year, or is that just the reality of, of fielding a championship type team this year, in this time? You know, uh, we, when it wasn't one and done, there were about maybe eight to 12 kids that we didn't get, we didn't recruit each year because we felt they would go right to the NBA. And most of them did, but some of them didn't. Then when one and done became an effect, we still didn't recruit those kids. And then we started to recruit because they said, well, maybe some of them or one of them could fit the profile for Duke. And when I say that, doesn't mean they're not great kids and all that, but there's a certain profile we look for for whether he's one and done or four years or whatever. And uh, so if we can find kids that fit our profile, we'll deal with the, the consequences of whether they're there for one, two, three, or four years. I, I think to get that, uh, to get the right kid is the most important, and then uh, we need to respond accordingly. If we, if we lose them earlier, then, then we, you would always like to have them stay for you know, the, the entire time. I think in a lot of respects, the kids would like to stay that long too, but they're just not, Financially, it's, it's, it's very difficult to make that decision. Right here in the middle. Hi, Mike. Steve Futterman from CBS News. I wanted to ask you, you have these four teams here with such a high pedigree. Three of the four coaches have won championships before. So much of what we've been talking about throughout the season has been this Kentucky team being still undefeated. No one's done that since the 70s, what, right. four decades. Can you talk about the respect you have for what Kentucky's been able to do even to this point and what it would mean, you know, uh, historically, if a team can go undefeated. How good well, the other three coaches don't want them to go undefeated. So, you know, we don't want to be a part of that history. Uh, but I, I, I said uh, yesterday, I think, that, uh, you know, the Kentucky story has been a great story for college basketball because we've talked about a team. Uh, and. I think part of uh, the marketing of our sport, because it's not coordinated like the NBA marketing, it, it, it started to shift towards what the NBA does in promoting individuals, and uh, especially the, one and the potential one-and-done players. And I, I thought that was to the detriment of our sport. And uh, this year with Kentucky's story, um, it's about a team. And, and at, hence, you've been talking more about other teams, too. So I, I think it's, it's been all good uh, for, for, for college basketball. Over here on the right. Mm -hmm. Kenny Ryan, Chicago Tribune. I wanted to ask you about the concept of clutch performers, clutch players. Um, is that something you feel like is just innate in a player, something a guy has? Is it something that can be developed? And obviously, Leitner is probably like the all-time clutch player in these. Uh, That's why eight. I love him. <laughs> yeah, just, it, did he just have that that quality within him too? If you could discuss all that, maybe. Yeah, I I think some of it it just happens for a youngster. Uh, they they have it. They have a a certain personality and a certain will, 
And then, but you know, in order to be a clutch player, you have to be good. <laughs> you know, like otherwise the coach isn't going to get. You, first of all, you won't be on the court, and uh, secondly, you won't get a play called for you, or you won't. You know, you. In other words, you see that, and you see that with talent, and then as a coach, you try to put talent and attitude in a position that in a, clutch, in a pressure situation, you have a better chance of winning if that kid has the ball. And uh, um, there have been a number of cl clutch performances by all these guys from all four teams. Yeah, that's why I've made mention of Trice. I think he's been a big time performer. Uh, Quinn Cook and Tyus at the end of games, for free throw wise. Uh, for us, the whole Kentucky team against Notre Dame, you know, you talk about a lot of clutch plays, but Harrison, you know, with his shooting, uh, you know, Decker in, the, in their regional championship game. So all the, you know, the constant is they're talented and, they're t and they have something about them that wants to be in those. They're, they're willing to accept the consequences of that play. Yeah, they're strong enough um, to absorb if they, if, they, if they don't do it. And uh, thank goodness they're, guys, they're players like that. Right here. Paula Bo Excuse me, Paula Bovin, Arizona Republic. Mike, what have been the traits that have made Jeff Capel a successful recruiter? Well, he, one, he, you know, he understands a player because he was a terrific player. He's been a head coach already and a very successful head coach. He was really the one who started the VCU program you know, to, you know, you look back and when he left to go to Oklahoma, he left some really good players there. And then he coached one of the best players in college basketball in Blake Griffin. And, uh, he, you know, he grew up, you know, his dad's a, a terrific coach. and. He just understands the game, and, and Jeff is very current. You know, he, you know, he, he knows how to communicate, music-wise, people-wise, sport-wise. You know, I, I just think he's one of the really gifted coaches, and he knows ball. You know, he was with me and was my main coordinator with the U.S. team when we won the World Cup in September in Madrid, and. Um, He's got, really, he's got everything. And uh, he and I have had an unbelievable relationship this year because of having lost Wojo and Chris Collins over the last two years. Back in the back. The Rogers, Inc. newspaper. Um, elements of college sports are generating large sums of money. Right. Um, the NCAA makes money. Uh, conference, the conferences make money but yet it seems like the most important element of the athletic equation, which is the athlete, continues to go unpaid. Do you ever think there will be a set of circumstances where the athletes can get compensated for some of the things that they do to make the sports where they are today? Well, I think we've, we've moved forward significantly in trying to do more for the student athletes. This past year has been a landmark year for how we feed, how we take care of an athlete, on our campuses. I mean, the, uh, will there be more? I hope so. Yeah, I don't. I, I don't know all the, you know, the things like with tax. You know, like the tax. You know, yeah. You know, what what a school does. I'm not familiar enough to know if being able to get paid would eliminate you from getting you know, uh, funds and that. But uh, taking care of them, even, you know, when we even for uh, this trip, a really cool thing. We're on the bus uh, going to the airport in Houston, and uh, our director of compliance, Todd Mesimov, goes in the back of our bus, and he has forms, and he talks to our guys. He said, you know, I got to talk to you about your, your families are going to receive $3,000, and we need to know, you know, for travel expenses and that for the final four. And if we make it another, you know, to Monday, they receive another $1,000. And our guys are like, wow, 
you know, and, and now should have that been done a long time ago? Yeah, but it, it's now being done. You know, how we feed them, what they get from a scholarship is, is much more. Hopefully we can keep doing more and take care of them to include health benefits after, afterwards, to make sure that their education is there if they do leave early, that it's always paid for, things like that. I, I'm not, I'm not uh, I wish I was good enough to be able to, if, if they could get paid, if they can, and it can be worked out, then obviously coaches would be all for it. But if not, then let's keep moving in the direction that we're moving, because certainly the players deserve that. Right here, Dana. Uh, Dana O'Neill with ESPN. Um, Mike, I, don't, I apologize if you've been asked, but you spoke yesterday about your relationship with Quinn. What makes that so special? Uh, yeah, I want to say everything. You know, uh, I, I love Quinn, and he, uh, uh, he's lovable. You know, he's, uh, um, he, he and Nolan are real close. Nolan's like his big brother. And he and Nolan both shared a very tragic experience in their lives in that they lost their fathers. Uh, I think Nolan when he was eight or nine and uh, Quinn when he was 14. And so a male, older male relationship is, it was voided, you know, there's a missing part. And I think we as, co uh, I think every coach would, would say this, when we recruit kids who have one parent, especially if their father is not a part of it, they understand that there's gonna be a different relation. They need to work on that. Like we work, uh, my middle daughter, Lindy, is our, our counselor for our team, she's a psychologist, and you know, we talk about how you develop a relationship with each kid, and that when you have that, th that's going to happen. In Quint's case, there was, there's, there's a damaged heart there. There's no question about it, but there's a beautiful heart there, and uh, so I, I think our relationship, I, I believe, has filled a little bit of that, and uh, and we believe in one another. You know, like, uh, for a whole year, and it just started, he's the one who started it. Every time we meet as a, as a team and we get together and we join hands, his hand is in mine. Every, there's not a, I mean, I don't know, there are hundreds of times, and he initiated that. And now I so look forward to it. And uh, so, you know, that's one of the beautiful things, you know, and beautiful thing was if we won the whole thing, but I'm not sure it'd be any more beautiful than, than that. We're gonna stop momentarily and welcome the uh, Duke players. Joining us, Quinn Cook, Tyus Jones, Justice Winslow, Matt Jones, Jaheel Okafor. And then we'll go back to the it back. Is. Back to the back over here. Jim Connors from Time Warner Cable News. Coach, guys, congrats <laughs> on the accomplishment of getting here. And this is for coach and whichever player wants to take it. Your opponent Saturday, what it may lack in talent, it makes up for in toughness relative to the number one seeds. And can you talk about at that uh, aspect of who they are plus the motivating factor of Tom's record against Duke and what that means for the challenge that you're gonna face Saturday night. Mike, we'll start with you. Yeah, well, the, the, the record, I'm not a big guy on records on Mondays, Tuesdays, coaches, when you were 18 and, uh, yeah, the stats are unbelievable, man. You know, like, I, that doesn't make, make a difference at all. You know, like, uh, you know, that, yeah, they're going to be ready. And you know what? They don't lack talent. Come on. I mean, Trice has been as good a player as there's been in this tournament. Brandon Dawson is as good an athlete. Valentine is as versatile a player. 
I mean, Michigan State is a championship level team. You know, they probably should have beaten Wisconsin, and I mean, they had it if they called an out of bounds, uh, guy out of bounds at the end of the game. They had the Big Ten championship one. You know, it's a championship level program and, and, and team. And so, were you trying to butter us up here or what? I make. I just told these. We just watched them. They didn't look. They looked pretty good, didn't they, on tape? So uh, anyway, that's my. I don't. If any of these guys want to answer, Quinn. Uh, they're very talented. Um, you know, obviously Michigan State is an elite program, so they're all there for a reason. You know, Coach Izzo does a great job, and uh, you know they're here for a reason. They've had an underdog mentality. You know, all March. You know, people count them out because they had a couple of losses. They had eight overtime games and. You know, they've had an underdog mentality. So, um, you know, it's, it's going to be a tough, tough game. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, they're here for a reason. You know, they're a championship-level team. So, you yeah. know, we have our hands full. They're six possessions away from being having 30-something wins and being a number one or number two seed. That's, that's the, how crazy our game is, you know, because they've been in so many close games. Back in the back. Uh, yeah, Kirk Wessler from the Peoria Journal Star. Mike? concept of student or I'm uh, sorry of servant leadership uh, I'm sure there have been leaders who servanthood is not the number one thing in their priorities but how important is that concept of servanthood to leadership in your mind and can you give a couple of examples of people who have been the epitome of that in your career oh there I'm, I have many examples yeah you know, I, I grew up in an uh, I went to school at a school that is about servant leadership you know, the United States Military Academy, our relationship with the military, if you're talking, you might as well just say everyone who's serving and, and, and in a leadership role, you know, whether it be Marty Dempsey, who's the chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, or a platoon sergeant in Afghanistan right now. You know, you're, you know to me, that's where I've learned, learned the most. And, you know, I mean, I, I, I can't, and can't think of any, any better example than that. Right, right here. Alec Johnson from the uh, National Sports Journalism Center. For uh, Coach K, you've, you've, been, you've coached many Final Four teams. What do you think makes uh, the identity of this year's Final Team unique, Final Four team unique? Uh, the fact that they play as one, and, and they, they've shown up to play every time, and uh, when they've been a little bit nervous or they weren't on top of their games, they were able usually, really except for two games in early January, they were able to turn it around and either win the game or put us in a position to win the game. So they've been a really easy group to coach because there, there hasn't been, um, they, they're, they're believers. So... Uh, yeah, but playing is one, and, and we have talent. Uh, so talent coordinated as one usually produces uh, some good results. Right here in front. Coach K, Corey Elliott, National Sports Journalism Center. You've been to many Final Fours. Obviously, the last time you were here in Indy, outcome was, was you know, what you want most out of a season. How special is it coming back to a place where you've won a national title? And I'm, I'm curious as to what ring you have on your right finger and if that has any significance. Uh, well, the ring I'm wearing on my, my, I actually have more than one right finger. There's <laughs> just, so I'm not a one finger guy. Uh, the, uh, it's our 2010 national championship ring. And, uh, just as I've worn it throughout the tournament, just as a reminder to me and to our team of our ultimate goal was, is to win a national championship. And usually I don't wear a uh, ring on my right fingers, but, uh, uh, but I did for the tournament, just not for luck or anything, just as a constant reminder of what it is. You know, to come back here, again, I think this is the best place to have it. Uh, nothing against any other place, but um, this, you know, it starts with the state of Indiana. They, they just love the game of basketball. And Indianapolis is where the NCAA is headquartered, and it, everything's within walking distance, and it's terrific. 
yesterday, I mean, for these guys, it's your, I, your first time in Lucas Soil. I mean, it, it was a huge thing. What did you guys think of the arena? Tyus? Um, it's, it's just special. It's just special. You can just feel it in the air, um, you know, how important it is and, and, and what, it, what it means, you know, to us, you know, to be here, um, to, to, you know, have a practice in Lucas Oil and, and just look out and see, you know, how many seats are out there. And, you know, on Saturday night, those seats are all going to be filled. It's just, uh, you know, a special feeling, and, and we're honored to be here. Justice? Uh, I just thought it was an amazing, you know, stadium, Lucas Oil, and uh, just being in Houston, uh, Last week, you know, they had the stadium kind of cut off, and, and this one was different. It was pretty much it's all open. And so uh, just to see how big it is and, you know, imagine, you know, all the fans in there filling it up, you know, it just seems like a, a special uh, a special night and a special place to have the Final Four. Okay, right over here, Mike. Michael Pointer from the Indianapolis Star. Um, Mike, when Tom was up here earlier and I asked him about shooting in domes, he said he feels like it's gotten better over the years because – you have situations where it's not just a court being dropped someplace. It's built a little more for basketball. Can you elaborate on that a little bit? Has it gotten a little, I don't want to say easier, but a little better for shooters over the years? And, and Quinn, if you could, when coaches finish, just elaborate on the challenges for a shooter in a dome. Mike? Well, we like that it's in a dome because that means more people are here. I think it's good for the game. And then it's up to players and coaches to adjust. That's why I think giving us an opportunity to practice yesterday for each team, to practice today and to shoot tomorrow uh, during the day. Uh, that should be enough, really, for it should, if, we, if, if we don't shoot well, we're not going to be up here Saturday night saying it was the Dome. It would be Michigan State probably. I don't know how you feel, Quinn. Yeah, I agree 100%. Um, That's what you're supposed to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, we get enough shots up, you know, uh, in practice and, and before the game, shoot around where, you know, I think we feel very comfortable with the gym. And, uh, you know, playing uh, at Syracuse this year, you know, was good for us. Playing last week, you know, at the Houston Texans Stadium w was good for our confidence. But, you know, I think it's all mental. You know, if you come in the game, you know, doubting your shot, doubting yourself, all oh, we're in the dome, you know, you're not going to shoot the ball well. So we're a very confident team. You know, coach gives us the ultimate confidence to shoot our shots. and. Uh, you know, so it'll probably be Michigan State, you know, more we'll worry about than the Dome. Okay, we got time for two more right here. Greg Logan of New York News, Day for Ja. Uh, everybody knows what a great offensive player you are with your footwork and everything. How much uh, work do you feel you need on, on defense, and, and can you improve with that big body? And, and maybe, uh, Coach K, if you could comment as well. Question for Joe Hill. Uh, I think I have improved as the season progressed, um, watching a lot of film with the coaches and talking to my teammates. Uh, they've been helping me out the entire season. So I think I've improved as the season progressed, and I'm going to continue to improve. Mike? Yeah, I think he should be with us for four years and had really improved. Uh, <laughs> the, uh, but no, he's, imp he's a good defensive player. He's a hell of a player, and we're, we're OK with Ja. We'll be our last question right here. Uh, Mick McKee from Detroit Free Press. Mike, if you grew up in Detroit instead of Chicago, you would be a one-finger guy. But uh, <laughs> Quinn and Mike, if you both could comment on the development of Tyus over the course of the season. I'll let Quinn start. Yeah. Um, well, he, he's grown up at a, at a fast pace. Um, coming into the season, um, you know, high, with high expectations, you know, his, him, Ja, Justice coming in, Grayson also coming in with high expectations. It's tough. But um, these guys came in, you know, so humble. You know, uh, that's the first thing that really struck out to me, how humble all four of these guys were. Um, you know, myself and Tyus, I mean, a lot of people try to make a big deal about, you know, us playing the same position, us not playing together. And that's made us closer. Um, you know, we wanted to play together. And uh, he's grown up so much, um, you know, always asking advice, always, you know, seeking, seeking advice from, you know, everybody on the team. And, uh, you know, he, he's just, he just, just improved so much, man. And, um, I'm, I'm, I'm happy that I share a backcourt with him because, you know, in my eyes, I feel he's one of the better guards in the country. So um, I'm, I'm happy uh, he's passing me the ball and I'm passing him the ball instead of me guarding him. So um, I'm just proud of my, how in the terrific freshman year he's had. Yeah, he's had a good teacher and it hasn't been his coach. It's been primarily Quinn. Thank you, Duke. All right. Good seeing you, Ock. All right. <laughs>